Right now on Morning News Now, tornado touchdown. A major cleanup is underway after severe storms ripped through parts of the south, tearing roofs off buildings, toppling power lines, and leaving debris in their wake. And the same system is now bringing heavy rain to millions on the east coast. We're tracking it all, and we'll tell you when things could finally dry out. Also this morning, we're learning new details about that Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza, how President Biden is responding, and what we now know about the victims. Plus, search and rescue missions are underway after a deadly earthquake rocked Taiwan. The tremors collapsing more than two dozen buildings and causing evacuations as far away as Japan. We have the latest on the ongoing rescue efforts and why the danger may not be over yet. And the next battleground over artificial intelligence could be music, why hundreds of stars are now teaming up to voice their concerns about the technology. That is a story you're going to bring us a little later. Yeah, some of the biggest names in the business trying to send a message to these AI companies saying, hey, don't use AI models, use human voices. Yeah, we'll so much that. of this impact in these creative industries. Exactly. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for being here on a Wednesday. We start this hour with the latest on that powerful storm system that's making it way across the country. The National Weather Service has confirmed at least one tornado touchdown in Kentucky, damaging homes and ripping up power lines, even overturning cars. Meanwhile, near St. Louis, Missouri, emergency crews were out in rafts along the Mississippi River rescuing people who were stranded by raging floodwaters. In parts of the northern U.S., it looks more like winter than spring. Six inches of snow fell in Wisconsin, and upstate New York and Vermont could get up to a foot of snow by Friday. And along the coast, the red flags are out on Oak Island, North Carolina, for the first time this year. That's because high winds are making it dangerous for people to swim at the beach. Let's take a look at the severe weather and let you know how it might impact you. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is here with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. This is a multifaceted system when it comes to impacts. We've got numerous of them. So let's start with what we're dealing with right now, which is the potential for some strong to even severe storms across parts of the southeast. Where you see this pink outline, that is a tornado watch that's going to remain in effect. We've already got some uh, thunderstorm warnings up. We've had multiple tornado warnings overnight across parts of the south. Southeast. This system is going to continue chugging to the east, and it will bring the other impacts, the rain, the snow, the strong winds, and the potential for flooding. Here's what we're dealing with right now. As you get out the door in places like Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Roanoke, even Washington, D.C., and New York, you're dealing with the rain. We've still got the snow draped across parts of the Great Lakes, so Chicago, Green Bay, Marquette, all dealing with that snow as you get out the door this morning. But this is the area we're going to watch for when it comes to the stronger and even severe storms. Now, one difference from yesterday to today, Yesterday, we had a really good chance of seeing plenty of, of tornadoes, and we did. We saw multiple reports. Right now, 12 reports of tornadoes from yesterday. We'll see which one of those get confirmed here as the day goes on. But today, our chance for tornadoes a little less. It isn't zero, but we're looking at the better chance to see some of those stronger wind gusts, maybe 60 miles per hour or higher. We could see some damaging hail, and it's draped across the mid-Atlantic and down to the southeast. So from Orlando to Washington, D.C., that's where you'll want to watch for that potential here as we get into especially the afternoon and evening hours today. We've also got 46 million people under these flood alerts, potentially really heavy rain working through this region, likely to cause some ponding on the roadways, the localized flooding all on the table. And then I showed you where we're dealing with the snow already. So no surprise that 11 million people at this hour are under those winter alerts. Some of the impacts, let's start with the winds. We're going to see strong winds across this region. This is why when we talk about the snow, in addition to those winds, the travel is going to be difficult on the roadways and the air. Uh, and we we'll likely we'll see some power outages too with this 40, 50 mile per hour winds across parts of the Great Lakes and the Northeast. New York looking at a peak wind gust of 46 miles per hour. And not to mention with those strong onshore winds, that means that we could be watching for some coastal flooding concerns. This will be something that we likely see closer to the coast, of course, as the day goes on. And we've also got that heavy rain falling uh, at really impressive rates. Some of these storm totals, three to three and a half inches across uh, the Northeast, will likely see the street and highway and river flooding. Uh, those swollen rivers will probably be a problem even into tomorrow too. And the snow, yes, April snow. We've got really heavy and wet snow that we're expecting and some impressive amounts up into portions of northern New England. A uh, foot to a foot and a half is going to be possible. You see places like Conway, Manchester, Burlington, uh, Rutland, all looking at some significant snow. And guys, I mentioned that we're going to see those heavy winds with this. So again, no surprise if we see some power outages some down trees from this mm. really heavy snow and the, the winds that we'll deal with. A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything.
pouring this morning. I know. It's, it's gloomy. Like dark, yeah. early. It will rainy. be all day. <laughs> Eventually yeah. it'll be summer. Don't worry. Exactly. <laughs> Eventually. Thank Thanks, you, Angie. Angie. Well, there were no major surprises overnight when both President Biden and former President Trump won their respective presidential primaries in four states. Both men are ramping up their campaigning for November's general election, having already sealed their party's nomination. Yesterday, Trump was back on the road visiting Michigan, where he accused President Biden of unleashing a, quote, bloodbath at the southern border. Trump dialed up the inflammatory rhetoric in his speech on immigration, with critics saying he's using dehumanizing language. After that, the former president headed next door to Wisconsin, another swing state. The Republican Party's presumptive nominee again falsely claimed he won that state in 2020 and challenged President Biden to debate him. We have an empty podium right here to my right. You know what that is? That's for Joe Biden. I'm trying to get him to debate. I'm calling on Crooked Joe to debate anytime, any place. We'll do it anywhere you want, Joe so that we can discuss in a friendly manner the real problems of our country, of which there are many. We're joined by NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen and our senior political editor Mark Murray. Good morning to both of you gentlemen. John, I will get started with you. We heard more controversial remarks from Trump at yesterday's events, as Joe mentioned. Walk us through some of the key moments and claims he made when he was both in Michigan and Wisconsin. As you pointed out just a, a moment ago, um, Donald Trump is out there. He's on the general election campaign trail. The first visit to Wisconsin in two years. He's been to Michigan more recently than that. Of course, they uh, have had a primary already this year. Um, but really, the big thing here is he's going to these states, and particularly in uh, Wisconsin yesterday at his rally, and arguing that he uh, had the election stolen from him. Uh, he not only did it at the rally, he did it on a radio interview yesterday. And of course, uh, there are all kinds of controversial claims that uh, and so misleading claims that uh, former President Trump makes at each of his rallies. Most of them are familiar, but I want to focus in for a minute on that uh, election denialism because uh, it's something that has been uh, pervasive for him since uh, since that 2020 election, um, and it's something that uh, in 2022 uh, during the run up to the midterms. Many Republicans were unhappy to hear. They kept saying they wanted him to get past this. They wanted him to admit reality. They wanted him to stop talking about it. It was hurting them. And now what you don't hear from any Republican elected officials is uh, is any recrimination against Trump for lying about what happened in the 2020 election. Uh, and so he's going to go out. He's going to continue to tell crowds this, uh, continue to mislead the American people on it. Uh, he has not suffered for it within his own party or within his own base. So there's no incentive for him to stop. So, Mark, many analysts are looking at the result of the Democratic primary in Wisconsin, where tens of thousands voted uninstructed. That's what it's called. That's in protest to President Biden's support for Israel, his handling of the war in Gaza. Tell us more about what we're seeing in Wisconsin. It's a state that Biden very narrowly won in 2020 and how significant this protest vote is looking forward. Yeah, Joe, the reason we're looking at those Wisconsin primary results is just how consequential Wisconsin has been, not only uh, in the 2016 and 2020 elections, but as we're looking ahead to 2024. And as you're not mentioning, about 50,000 people ended up voting in the Democratic primary were uninstructed, representing about 8% of all total voters. And uh, these kind of campaigns have come up because there are Democrats and Democratic aligned groups who want to protest uh, President Biden. Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. But as far as actually how crucial and what kind of signals this actually sends, I'm not necessarily sure. Polling does show that the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war has certainly uh, been uh, a, 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 not a great situation for the president. Uh, but, uh, you know, do note that sometimes that people say, hey, I could vote uncommitted or uninstructed. But when you get to the general election, and it is a choice between President Biden and former President Donald Trump, people might vote a different way. I think the best way to actually look at states like Wisconsin and others is to look at the pollings that we have right now. And right now, Wisconsin looks to be a very, very close contest between Trump and Biden. 
John, we saw yesterday the Biden campaign release a new ad, and it was specifically attacking Trump on abortion rights. Now, we know this is going to continue to be a flashpoint in this election. We look at places like Florida, which essentially just cleared the way for a six-week abortion ban. But importantly, that's something that we'll actually see on the ballot there. Walk us through just how much of an issue this is going to be and how much we may see this traded as an attack between the two candidates. It's perhaps the best issue for Democrats in swing states in this election, so you're going to continue to hear a lot about it. One of the ways that you can tell that it's a great issue for Democrats is they are uh, putting uh, putting out ads like the one that uh, you just showed, uh, while Republicans are stumbling all over themselves on abortion. Uh, in particular, uh, former President Trump uh, still doesn't have a position for this year on what he wants to do on abortion, whether he wants to support uh, a national ban on abortion, how many weeks that national ban on abortion would be, what he thinks about uh, a Florida court ruling uh, this week that puts in place uh, that 15-week ban there and then triggers a six-week ban later. So uh, Trump has had nearly every position on abortion uh, over the course of his career from the time when he was, uh, you know, basically a, a liberal Democrat and was, um, you know, for abortion rights to this moment now, uh, where he, um, you know, where he is struggling to come up with what today's position is, but he's kind of been all over the place on it. Uh, I think you're going to hear uh, a lot about abortion over the course of the next seven months. And Mark, there are a few other issues on the ballot in Wisconsin yesterday. The AP projects voters have approved two constitutional amendments which change how elections are run and paid for. Real quick, walk us through the changes and, and the impact they could have. Yeah, real quick, Joe, John was just talking about the election denialism that Donald Trump was repeating yesterday. And these uh, 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 ballot measures had to do with some of those claims, uh, including using private funds for election administration, which Donald Trump falsely ended up saying kind of swayed the outcome of what ended up happening in Wisconsin. This was put by Republicans to eliminate the use of private funds in election administration. It's unclear what kind of impact this would end up having in November. But of course, everything matters when you end up having a very close contest. Mark, John, thank you both very much. This morning, a federal appeals court will hear arguments over Texas's controversial immigration enforcement law, which gives local police the ability to detain and deport suspected undocumented migrants. The law is currently on hold after a panel of appellate judges sided with a federal judge who ruled that the law is likely unconstitutional and conflicts with federal immigration policy. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has been following these developments, joins us with the latest. Julia, good morning. So what is today's hearing expected to focus on? Could we expect a ruling today or will it take a little time? Well, it'll probably take a little time, Joe. We've seen a really fast game of ping pong over this issue with the Supreme Court weighing in, saying it could, it, 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 there needed to be a stay, and then reversing that stay, and then the circuit court taking it up, and it, it's really just gone back and forth. There was even a moment where it was allowed to go forward for about 24 hours. Now, we should expect a little bit of a pause, and that's because the circuit court, the appeals court, actually wants to weigh in on the constitutionality of this law. So far, all of these rulings have just gotten into whether or not it can go forward in the meantime while they consider this question. So today they're giving both sides 30 minutes to present their arguments and then we should uh, have we should expect a little time by these three judges, one appointed by Biden, one appointed by Trump and one appointed by George W. Bush will consider the constitutionality of SB4. And we should say that Texas seems to have the higher hill to climb here. Julia, one of the big sticking points here in this law is the fact that it allows judges in Texas to send migrants, regardless of their nationality, to Mexico specifically. What's Mexico's position on that part of the law? Well, yeah, I mean, that's where a big part of the logistics here just fall apart because Mexico has said, no, they won't take migrants who have been deported by Texas judges. These judges have not been trained by the Justice Department to even know how to adjudicate who should remain and who should be deported. Mexico also hasn't agreed to take nationals that aren't from their country. And they also say that it violates their sovereignty to and human rights uh, to take those migrants because it's not up to Mexico to negotiate with each individual United States on who they'll take back, they have negotiated already and continue to negotiate with the federal government of this country. And Julia, no matter how the court rules, does it seem likely this is going to end up back before the Supreme Court? 
Absolutely. I think no matter who wins here, we'll expect the other side to appeal and go before the Supreme Court. And then it'll really be an interesting case to watch because the Supreme Court, although it is conservative, they have consistently sided with the federal government when it comes to enforcing immigration law because we have a 150-year tradition of the federal government enforcing our borders and not individual states. So Texas today will make the argument that the Biden administration hasn't done enough and it's up to them to step in. But the They'll have to answer a lot of questions in order to prove that and to even talk about how this would look. And when they made these arguments before the same court on the stay, uh, they did not win. And the judges asked some pretty tough questions, including what would you do if a migrant who came in through Arizona ended up in Texas? Uh, and they weren't able to answer that at the time. They may have done more homework in the meantime, but they still have a, a pretty tough hill to climb here, Joe. All right. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much. Well, not a Taiwan where a 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck the island during their morning rush hour. At least seven people are dead. Dozens of buildings have been reduced to rubble and thousands are without power. It's said to be the most powerful quake to hit the island in a quarter century. NBC News international correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer has the latest. This is the moment the earthquake hit. A magnitude 7.4 according to U.S. estimates. The morning quake rocking city landmarks, Gosh. violently shaking homes. This TV newsroom left swaying, as was this rooftop swimming pool. Water falling down another one in this building. The most powerful quake to strike Taiwan in a quarter century. Worst hit the coastal city of Hualien, just 15 miles from the epicenter. Several buildings were left partially crumbled and dangerously teetering. Emergency workers searching for dozens of people trapped in damaged buildings or under debris. Annie Lima, an American living in Taiwan, was in Hualien when it hit. My husband and I jumped to our feet and ran for the nearest doorway and braced ourselves, and we could barely keep our balance, you know, holding both sides of the doorway. And all around us, things were falling off the walls and off shelves, smashing and crashing everywhere. The quake and multiple aftershocks triggered landslides around the island, trapping hikers on trails, hitting the capital of Taipei during the morning commute. It set off tsunami warnings in the Philippines and Japan, where thousands were sent racing to higher ground. This is what Jason Delicta is cleaning up in Hualien, where the American owns a restaurant. We lost, like, uh, you know, most of our plates. A part of the world accustomed to earthquakes, but few as fierce as this. Our thanks to Janice Mackey Fair for that report. Well, we are learning new details this morning about the seven World Central Kitchen workers killed in an Israeli airstrike yesterday. The humanitarian aid group released the identities of the victims of the attack, including one U.S. citizen. The World Central Kitchen is now accusing Israel of using food as war and called the act unforgivable. The White House is also condemning the airstrike. White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby had this to say in response to the bombing. We were outraged to learn of an IDF strike that killed a number of civilian humanitarian workers yesterday from the World Central Kitchen, which has been relentless in working to get food to those who are hungry in Gaza and, quite frankly, around the world. We send our deepest condolences to their families and loved ones. More than 200 aid workers have been killed in this conflict, making it one of the worst for aid workers in recent history. This incident is emblematic of a larger problem and evidence of why distribution of aid in Gaza has been so challenging. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released a statement following the attack saying, quote, unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic case of our forces unintentionally hitting innocent people in the Gaza Strip. It happens in war and we will do everything so that this does not happen again. We have NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter and NBC News chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander joining us this morning with the latest details on this attack. Molly, good morning. I will get started with you. What is the latest information we have about the strike and also about the victims? Savannah Joe, good morning. We are learning new details about the kind of sequence of events. So we know that it was a three-car convoy leaving a warehouse in Deir al-Bala that is in the central Gaza Strip. They had just unloaded food at a warehouse and they were heading south. Now, NBC News has located all three vehicles 
uh, on a map, and you can see the pictures right here on your screen. Two armored, one soft shell. Now, the photos show three separate precision strikes. One car showing clear signs of a missile strike, one showing kind of completely burnt out, and you can see that right there. And one has been basically completely destroyed. And you can see the very clear markings of World Central Kitchen. All three cars on about a mile and a half of a coastal road. Now, World Central Kitchen, you guys, has also now put out the names of the victims, and I do think we have, you showed some of their pictures in the intro, I do think we have that to show our audience. Uh, those victims right there, as you can see, include 33-year-old American Canadian citizen Jacob Flickinger. Peter, President Biden called World Central Kitchen founder Chef Jose Andres to say he was heartbroken over the attack. He also promised to make clear to Israel that aid workers must be protected. What else are we hearing from the White House about this? Well, you played the words from John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesperson earlier, uh, indicating the White House, the president's outrage on this, the president releasing a statement late yesterday saying as much. And really, it is this issue of the impact on humanitarian aid workers by some accounts, as many as 200, 200 aid workers have been killed in Gaza since the start of this war now, um, six months in. The president in this statement said that they want to see, the U.S. wants to see an investigation. He said it has to be swift, it has to bring accountability, and that the findings must be public. But again, specifically to that issue of the aid workers, listen to this language from his statement. I want to read it to you because it is certainly sharper in tone than we have heard in the past. He says, Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians. Incidents like yesterday's simply should not happen. Israel also has not done enough to protect civilians widely. So the president communicating his uh, his deep concern about the situation taking place there. Uh, there is an American team that has been in Cairo and Egypt recently working on an immediate ceasefire. But to this point, Joe, of course, the White House has been reluctant to call for any permanent ceasefire because it remains a top priority of the U.S. to support Israel's right to defend itself and to help support getting the hostages, including some Americans home. Joe and Savannah. And Peter, does the Biden administration really intend to hold Israel accountable in a specific way here? You mentioned, you know, 200 or more humanitarian groups experiencing yeah. this, humanitarian workers, I should say. Does this airstrike, is this different than those previous attacks? Do you think something different will come of it? Well, uh, there are a series of things that are different about this one. One, Jose Andres has a very loud megaphone. He is an international figure, and this certainly has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, and I think it's going to maintain a lot of the focus over the course of the next several days, as we anticipate Andres will say things publicly, perhaps do an interview, which again adds to the pressure on the Israelis right now. As it relates to the U.S. position on this, again, the U.S. not calling for any permanent ceasefire yet, but a lot of the focus, including in a conversation that took place just a couple of days ago between U.S. and Israeli officials, a virtual call is on what happens next in the city of Rafah. Of course, that's the southern border city right now. There are more than a million Palestinians who are crammed into that area with desperate conditions. The fear of famine continues to grow by the day right now. And the U.S. has made clear that the Israeli desire to go in there in any way similar to what it did in other towns like Khan Yunus, Gaza City itself, where the death toll was so dramatic among civilians would be unacceptable. The president right now trying to push forward. And I think what you could keep an eye on the days ahead is the growing pressure for any conditions to be placed on the Israelis in terms of the provision of aid of not humanitarian, but military aid to the Israelis going forward. So, Molly, coming off of that, what are Israelis saying about this today? I mean, World Central Kitchen is one of several NGOs working on the ground there. Yeah, that's right. And actually, I just want to add to Peter's, look, Jose Andres does have a very loud megaphone. He's been on our air a lot, and he actually came out with an op-ed today, which is really making an impact. And I just want to read a tiny bit from that op-ed, just to kind of help paint the picture of the kind of pressure that Chef Jose Andres uh, will definitely be able to put on Israel, on the international community. He writes, Israel's better than the way this war is being waged. It is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinate, coordinated their movements with the Israeli Defense Forces. That is one thing that World Central Kitchen is emphasizing today, is that their movements, those movements of the three-car convoy were coordinated with Israeli defense officials. They knew that that convoy was going to those locations. And actually, Raf Sanchez, our correspondent in Tel Aviv, pressed an Israeli government spokesperson about the precision strikes. Take a quick listen to that. 
Israel tells the world that its strikes are based on precise intelligence, that it takes measures to make sure there are not civilians in the area. How can that possibly be true, given what happened here? There's a war going on. It, it, it's, a, it's a war zone. And in every war, sadly, um, tragically, uh, mistakes happen. And we do our very utmost to avoid those mistakes. That explanation uh, clearly not landing well with World Central Kitchen uh, or John Kirby. You heard his sound earlier, as Peter referenced. As far as impact, World Central Kitchen, as you mentioned, is one of several NGOs, but they've really been pushing the boundary, specifically focusing on the north of Gaza. Right now, they have paused their operations. If they suspend their operations seriously, uh, this will have a serious, serious impact on the amount of food getting to the north of Gaza right now. Savannah? Just a testament to the incredible work that they were doing. Molly Hunter and Peter Alexander, thank you both very much. We have a lot more to get to today on Morning News Now. We are digging into the new study tackling why some people have to work harder to lose weight. First, though, next week's solar eclipse is the source of a new legal fight for prisoners in one state. Why they say it all has to do with freedom of religion. That is up next. Welcome back. Millions of Americans are making all kinds of plans for how they're going to take in next week's solar eclipse. That includes inmates. So the New York State Department of Corrections says it's going to lock down prisons during the solar event due to safety concerns. Well, now inmates are taking legal action, suing the department, arguing the lockdown violates their constitutional right to practice their faith. Here with more on this is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. Thanks, as always, for joining us. So first, just... Walk us through getting to this point of actually filing this lawsuit. What exactly are inmates arguing? They're arguing that they have sincerely held religious beliefs, which is something that they have to demonstrate, and that those religious beliefs are being infringed upon by not being allowed to watch the eclipse. I know a lot of prisoners. Uh, this is not that uncommon. There is so much case law out there, and it, it varies, really. I mean, there's so many different kinds of freedom of expression cases in prison, and inmates have nothing but time on their hands, so they come up with creative arguments and creative religions mm -hmm. and creative uh, ideas for things that they want. And so this happens actually fairly often. I don't think this is a winner uh, because this is probably the eclipse locking people down during it. There is a safety concern. We're all told that if we look at it, we'll go blind. I mean, there are concerns about looking at the eclipse. And also, as far as I know, and I'm not a religious scholar, None of the religions that I saw that were cited, and some of them were recognizable, Unitarian uh, religions of these inmates, uh, none of them have any rule that eclipses are of any particular religious significance. So I don't know that they win on that point either. It's not like a, uh, a special day. We don't have eclipse day that I know of in any of the major religions. Maybe there is, and I just don't know it. But uh, I think that's going to be a really real uphill battle for these inmates. Also, they've actually said that they're going to pass glasses out so that they can be watched or, you know, you could try to see out of individual cell windows. Does that carry any weight here, the fact that they are kind of making some accommodations for safely at least looking, even if it's not outside? I don't think that helps the inmates too much because this is the kind of accommodation that is made with no consideration as to religion. In other words, it's what's called generally applicable. They're not saying, hey, we're going to give the glasses out to the Muslims and not to the Christians. They're just saying we're giving glasses out because it's a safety concern, the same way you'd give out a helmet or something else that might mm. uh, protect somebody. So they're giving these out to everyone. And it really, in prison, if you happen to be, they're basically saying, if you happen to be in the yard and you can look up, good for you. But if you're in your cell, too bad, so sad. That is life in prison. But, you know, the courts are full of these kinds of cases because inmates often litigate them either pro se or they find uh, an attorney to help them. So there's actually a ton of case law on this issue. I just don't think they win on this particular argument. And prisons have fairly broad authority, right, in terms of saying what is and is not allowed in their facilities where people can and cannot be? Yes, there is one thing that is absolute. You and I and prisoners have the absolute right to believe within the confines of our skull, whatever we want to believe. Nothing can take that away from us. And the technology is as it is right now. You can't really get into somebody's head and make them stop believing it, although that's coming up around the corner, I'm sure. But for now, you can believe whatever you want. It's conduct. 
that can be regulated. And prisons heavily regulate conduct. That being said, there are instances, for example, of Native Americans getting sweat lodges in prison and mm. different victories along the way. Dietary restrictions are a great example. Sometimes you can get different diets based on your religion. That's an accommodation that is often made. This one, I don't see them being successful. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you as always. A little different one for you today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn to some international headlines now, starting with a deadly fire at a nightclub in Istanbul. Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. The governor of Istanbul said that at least 29 people have now died after a fire engulfed a popular nightclub in the city center during renovation works. Now, officials say that among the dead are workers and employees who were involved in the renovation of the masquerade club in the city center, when at least one other person was being treated at a hospital with serious injuries. The cause of the fire is under investigation, and several people, including managers of the club, were, det were detained for questioning. Let's go to Ukraine now, where President Zelensky signed a new law that lowers the mobilization age for combat duty from 27 to 25. The bill was approved by the government in May last year, but the president signed it only on Tuesday. The move comes in a difficult moment for the Ukrainian army, which is facing both a shortage of soldiers and ammunition. The new bill will expand the number of civilians the army can mobilize into its ranks to fight under martial law. And let's end this tour of the world in Senegal, where the country's youngest ever president has just been sworn in. 44-year-old Basiru Diomaye Faye, a former tax inspector, swept to a first-round victory in the presidential election. Faye was among political opponents freed from prison 10 days before the election as part of an amnesty announced by the previous president, Maki Sol. In his victory speech, Faye promised that under his leadership, Senegal will be a country of hope, peace, and with independent judiciary and strengthened democracy. Savannah? All right, Claudio Lavanga, thank you so much. Well, coming up, mask off. Philadelphia's controversial ski mask ban was meant to help curb crime, but opponents say it may actually be putting people in danger. We will explain up next. We are back with a controversial law that's dividing much of Philadelphia. It's been three months since a ski mask ban went into effect, but local officials say the police have yet to put together a plan to actually enforce it. Those who support the ban say it will help curb crime, while critics argue it will disproportionately target young black men. NBC News Stay Tuned correspondent Marquise Francis joins us with more on the debate. Marquise, it's wonderful to have you in studio this morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. That law passed in early December under a lot of scrutiny. So I went to Philadelphia to gain a better understanding of its impact. Many business owners told me the ski mask spam makes them feel safer, while teens and young people told me that being able to conceal their identity is likely the only reason they're still alive. Take a listen. That ski mask may be the reason that somebody did not notice them and did not open fire. Sometimes people don't want to be seen. Sometimes you put a mask on to make you feel comfortable. You're in your own little world. Philly is all about survival. So, I mean, if you don't know how to survive, then I don't know how you're going to live in Philly for a verb. Putting an affirmative, the bill passes. In an effort to curb crime, Philadelphia passed a law late last year banning the wearing of ski masks throughout public spaces. We move forward and we make progress as a people and city when we remove our masks. Yet critics note there's no data that says banning ski masks will reduce crime. In fact, violent crime was down in 2023 as compared to 2022, according to city data. Property crimes during the same period, however, took off. More than three months since the ban became law, there have been instances of authorities asking residents to remove their masks on public transit. But police have yet to enforce the law or issue fines in public spaces, according to local officials. This has sparked both confusion and anger amongst residents. There's a lot of adults around the city who say, I do get a little weary when I'm walking down the street and I see someone walking towards me with a ski mask. And so what do you say to them who say, we actually like the ski mask ban? Just because you have a ski mask, that does not mean you're going to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. And I think us putting a correlation between the two is definitely problematic. Like Some residents told me the ban makes them feel more safe in a city seemingly struggling to contain crime. 
when people be walking out here with the masters on. Like some guys be trying to come in here, you gotta tell them no, because it's not comfortable for me or the clients. But for others, particularly young people who often wear them, they say the band compromises their survival. I have a ski mask on. I didn't cause any harm to anybody. I don't plan on causing harm, any harm to anybody. Philly, you got pick your poison. Like 19-year-old Liam Washington, who says the ski mask is much more than a fashion accessory. He says it also keeps him from being a victim of mistaken identity, which he says could put him at risk of violence. Well, you got to either walk around and protect yourself or walk around and be a victim. What prompted the ban was how ski masks have been worn by criminals at the center of multiple deadly shootings, including the death of 15-year-old Devin Whedon who was on his way to school last May when he was fatally shot during a fight by three people, one of whom was in a ski mask. No one has been arrested or charged in the killing. Sit down. The victim's father told me he supports the ban. If we can go with a solution with this, I'll tell you this, a lot of crime will go down. Because you can't catch nobody if you don't see nobody. But many teens say not everyone who wears them is a criminal. So we're creating a situation where a subset of folks feel safer and another subset of folks are pushed into unsafe situations in fear. But whose fear, whose safety is more important? The official behind the new law says banning ski masks will make the city safer for everyone. This bill was created because we can't just have no face, no trace. So what do you say to a young person who says, I feel safer with this ski mask on, I don't feel yeah. safe without it? If you don't feel safe without having a ski mask on, we have a larger problem in the city of Philadelphia. Marquis, great report. So have we seen this be successful in stopping crime in other cities? Are there some use cases of this? Well, that's still to be determined, right? As I noted in the piece, there's still no evidence that banning ski masks actually reduces crime. We heard a councilman, Anthony Phillips, talk about he believes it will. He noted he's actually the person who proposed this bill last summer. He noted at least three instances in which suspects were armed and shot and killed people in Philadelphia, and they had on ski masks. And police were unable to identify who they were. And he believes this will now allow police officers to do their job. And he's not alone. There's about 15 members on the Philadelphia City Council, and 13 of them supported this. Only two mm. were against it. On the flip side of things, you talk to young people and criminal justice advocates, and they say, you ban the ski mask, and then people can just wear sunglasses, cover their faces with bandanas. And so what is this actually doing? And this is more so a Band-Aid for really addressing real issues. And then in talking to young people, understanding different tensions in certain pockets of the city, they're saying this ski mask helps them conceal their identity from would-be people trying to settle neighborhood vendettas. Mm. And so you're really hearing a kind of push and pull. And as that last council member mentioned, Miss um, uh, Kendra, she said that whose safety is most important when you have business owners saying they feel unsafe and you have young people saying they actually are unsafe. So. Mm. All right, Marquise, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. Time now for our weekly medical checkup. This week we're taking a look at losing weight and why some people have to put in more work than others to achieve the same weight loss results. Plus we're going to shine a light on our furry friends. We love to do that and how a new study suggests that your dog may be able to detect when you're stressed. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us to discuss some of these health headlines you might have missed. Dr. Patel, good to have you with us. So let's start with a new study out of Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Found some people may have to work out harder than others to lose the same amount Lovely. of weight. I think that's me. I think yeah. That's Same. Exactly. Why, why is that? <laughs> All right, let me let me give you the kind of bottom line up front. This was an observational study, so I just want to caveat that they didn't do the study to look at people who had a high genetic risk and to see how much weight they needed to lose or what activity they needed to do. So the good news here is that we can all overcome our genetic activity. What they did in this study is they looked at about 3,000 people who are wearing Fitbit. This is the first time they looked at genetic data, activity data from a Fitbit, and then kind of clinical data as well. All of that combined over about five years. They followed 3,000 middle-aged adults, found that for people who had a higher genetic risk for obesity from all those different factors that we talk about, family history, genetics, measuring your blood and certain factors, that you needed to probably walk an average of 2,000 to 6,000 more steps than someone who had a lower genetic risk. Hmm. That can be a lot of steps in a day. That could be anywhere from 10,000 to 16,000 steps. That's a lot. So that's just one of the reasons I caveat this as saying, don't run out and try to put 16,000 into your Fitbit because <laughs> it's just very hard to do that. <laughs> so the doctor's orders here are to really think about personalizing your workout 
and that you can overcome genetic risk. Genetic risk is just one contributing factor. It does not need to define you or kind of how you do this. When you sit down with a plan, dietitian, doctor, kind of all of us can come together and get a good plan for you to lose weight. Hmm. There you go. Love it. Yeah, 16,000 steps in a day. That would be very hard. Even in New York, yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> uh, Dr. Patel, yeah. okay, let's talk about our dogs now. So a new pilot study says that they can tell when we're stressed. I will say my dog Lucy has a lot of issues. However, she, I think, is amazing at this. You tell me if it's real or not, but I'm not even kidding. Like, if I'm upset or, like, if I'm crying, she will come and sit in my lap and, like, lick the tears off my face. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Tell us if this is real. You're, you, it is real, Savannah. Here's, here's where we have known for decades now that dogs can be incredibly helpful for diabetics before they go into a diabetic attack and also for people who have seizures before they even have a seizure. And that's because as humans, we emit a certain chemical compound, especially during hmm. states of stress, which is what people with seizures, when you're having an emotional kind of trauma, all of these things, especially in PTSD. So the researchers set out to see if the same things we know about epilepsy, diabetes, and other things that we use dogs for can be used in people with PTSD. So they found two canines that were just really good at doing what Lucy does and kind of understanding <laughs> what's happening to human emotions and to human sense. And then they took adults and they put face masks on them and actually emitted either a control or odor, which had no scent, or a scent that was close to some sort of trauma by kind of reliving a trauma. And they found that the dogs were actually pretty darn accurate, anywhere from about 76% to as high as 90% accuracy in detecting that stress. So the doctor's orders here divert from distress. This is not something that everybody's going to have access to. We need more research for it. And use the psychotherapy tools that are at your disposal so that we can attack stress where it happens and even before it happens. Hmm. Real quick, we want to hit one more NYU Langone Health yes. provides insight into how memories are kept in our brains. We literally only have a few seconds, but what's the main headline here? Main headline here, walk and pause. If you want to keep something sealed, if you want to remember that last show you watched, that movie, that great date, pause and get a good night's rest. The doctor's hmm. orders here, relax to remember and try to avoid stimulus overload. Wow. If you binge and you don't remember what you watched, it's because you're binging. If you want to remember something, take a moment, walk after that great movie or great concert, and you'll probably seal that. your memories. That's what my study shows. All right. Yes, it's a great, it's a great way to remember. Some good advice there. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Take coming care. up, love and money. Combat compatibility is important in any relationship, but how do you know if you and your significant other are financially compatible? We'll tie you up next. Back to financial headlines. Disney is entering the final stretch of its proxy battle against activist investor Nelson Peltz. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news this morning. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, it's the big day. Disney has reportedly prevailed in its boardroom fight with activist investor Nelson Peltz, who has been seeking to install himself and a former Disney executive on the board and major changes at the company. Now, reports say Disney's largest shareholder, which is mutual fund giant Vanguard, is backing CEO Bob Iger and the board. Results of the vote will be announced at Disney's annual meeting today. The price of fun has never been higher. A new bank rate survey finds more than one third of Americans are willing to go into debt for at least one discretionary purchase this year, such as travel, dining out, or even attending a live event. For travel, 30% say they plan to spend more this year, while 25% plan to spend more on dining and 22% for live entertainment. And the future of the Super Bowl champs may be in doubt. Voters in Jackson County, Missouri, rejecting a sales tax measure that would have helped pay for major renovations to Arrowhead Stadium. That's the home of the Kansas City Chiefs and a new ballpark for the Royals. The Chiefs could try again on a reworked plan voters can agree on, seek more private investment, or even listen to offers to move the team to another city or state. The current lease at the Chiefs and Royal Sports Complex runs through January of 2031, guys. All right, Savannah Hanau, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's stay on money. For many couples, it's considered a major factor that can make or break a relationship. Financial experts say it's important to be upfront with your partner about finances early on in order to keep your relationship out of the red, so to speak. Yeah, but that might be easier said than done. So how can you approach talking money with your partner? Well, we're so excited to have Jason Tartek join us with some helpful tips. He's an entrepreneur and finance expert, also the author of a new book. Here it is right here, Talk Money. 
money to me the eight financial questions to discuss with your partner Jason good morning thanks for joining us Good morning thank you for having me great to have you here so we're gonna get into those eight in just a minute but okay. first just tell us how do you even get started with this conversation and when we say early like how early should you be talking about this I mean I say from date one you can introduce money in a fun way like I could ask you a question right now if you get ten thousand dollars you got to spend it today what are mm. you gonna spend it on mm. instantly I hear your priorities and you have fun with it so I think you can do it from an early onset and I say married or cohabitating couples you have to talk about these eight numbers before you move in together so let's look at these elite eight I don't know if we can talk about all of them but let's hit the highlights here what should we know about so the biggest thing I used to work for the bank I had the big rubber stamp that said approve or deny so I said wait I used to look at numbers why don't I give the consumer the numbers the bank would look at mm. to classify their liability and risk so those are the eight numbers biggest one is net worth it's the ultimate scorecard whether you buy something today or earn something tomorrow it will be adjusted Hmm, very interesting net worth and a lot of other good ones there, credit score, that type of thing. What financial red flags should we be paying attention for, listening for? So the biggest issue is when we hear about relationships and red flags, it's a hot topic right now. We know exactly what to look for, we know who to talk to. When we hear financial red flags, we don't even know where to turn or mm. who to talk to. But what we do know is that people that lie about their finances, there's a correlation to infidelity and financial infidelity. Oh. Infidelity is the number one reason why people get divorced and money are arguments are the number two. Forty-three percent of married and cohabitating couples, one person is committing financial infidelity. So if you see that your spouse oh. or partner is lying about their finances, that is the ultimate red flag right now. Oh. So when you talk about couples and the type of accounts they should have that can help with transparency, how do you kind of merge all that together so you're all on the same page? So, so that one's so hard because every situation is different. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I lay out all different options. One I call is the teeter-totter. Look at what your incomes are. Decide how much you want to contribute to a joint account. Then pro rata, based on your earnings, contribute that amount connected to your salaries, and then have your own independent accounts. Again, that's not the per perfect uh, subscription for everyone, but that's one that I've seen be effective. When you say a lie, like define yeah. what's a lie versus just like keeping a little bit of autonomy, you know, like how you want to spend the money that you make. Yeah, going to get a cup of coffee or buying what's important to you, that's not the lie. What financial infidelity is classified as is material manipulation and cheating through your finances. So stealing, taking from different accounts, and we're talking about material amounts of money. And this stuff is happening nonstop. There's one example in this book about someone who married someone within a year. They had more income. She had better credit. She took the mortgage out. She put his name on the deed. They didn't have a contract. The day she closed, the IRS owned her house because of his back taxes that oh. he didn't talk about. I got thousands of these inquiries when I was writing this book. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah. terrifying. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Jake the Tartic, really yeah. good information. Thank you so much. That was Thank fun. You. Good Thanks to have you here. Congrats on the book. Thank you. Coming up off key, the battle over AI is taking center stage in the world of music. How artists from across the spectrum are rallying together to take on the technology. That's next. Welcome back. A piece of mystery themed history is going up for auction. First, let's set the scene with a little trip back in time. One summer night back in 1889, famous authors Conan Doyle and Oscar Wilde sat down for dinner in London. By the end of the night, Doyle agreed to write one of his most famous Sherlock Holmes stories, The Sign of Four. Well, now Doyle's letters talking about that night and his only handwritten manuscript of The Sign of Four are going up for auction. It's expected to snag around $1.2 million just for the manuscript alone, Joe. You bidden? No, <laughs> but, uh, but someone will, and they will enjoy Pretty it Pretty cool, though, right? And it'll mean more to them. A little <laughs> right. piece of history. Thanks, Savannah. Finally this hour, some of the biggest names in music are coming together to voice concerns over AI. From Casey Musgraves to Nicki Minaj, Stevie Wonder to Pearl Jam, more than 200 artists have signed an open letter to AI developers and tech companies. They're warning that left unchecked, AI could degrade the value of their work and prevent musicians from being fairly compensated. To Bon Jovi, AI is the new bad medicine. To Billie Eilish, it's the new bad guy. I'm the bad guy. Duh. Their concerns voiced in an open letter signed by 200 plus musicians, including Smokey Robinson, the Jonas Brothers, and Katy Perry, saying in part, the use of artificial intelligence infringes upon and devalues the rights of human artists, adding this assault on human creativity must be stopped. Cheryl 
Cheryl Crow signed the letter. Her new album, Evolution, is inspired by AI concerns. It terrifies me that I can sing to you a song that I had absolutely nothing to do with, and you'll believe it. Fears grew louder last year with this totally AI-generated song, a deep fake of Drake and The Weeknd, raising concerns about just how easy it is to clone voices, as demonstrated in this video. But I attack the whole religion all because of my ignorance. You might notice that I sound like Kanye West. No, Yeezy didn't record a voiceover for me. This is AI. So let me come back to my original voice for a second because this is crazy. Music makers worry companies are training AI models to replace human artists. <laughs> Last month, Tennessee became the first state to pass a law protecting musicians from AI, the Elvis Act, which stands for ensuring likeness, voice, and image security. Luke Bryan was at the bill signing. It's a real big deal now, and it's going to get... Hopefully this will curb it. From Music Row to Hollywood, securing AI protections was a priority last year for striking actors and writers. Now it's musicians who are raising their voices. Legislation to protect artists has been introduced at the federal level in Congress, and those bills do have bipartisan support but have yet to pass. But this open letter, it's not about legislation. The goal is to reach out to those tech and digital companies, encouraging them to work with artists and not replace humans with AI. Don't huge issue that's only going to get exactly. bigger. Exactly. All right. Mm. That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a grave mistake. Israel's top military official now admitting that an Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza should not have happened. But we know this morning about those victims and the investigation now underway as Iran vows retaliation for a separate deadly strike that it says was also carried out by Israel. We're also following some tragic breaking news out of Taiwan overnight, where at least nine people are dead, hundreds of others injured after a massive 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck off the island's east coast. The scenes of destruction and devastation this morning as the island reels from its strongest quake in decades. Also this morning, out of office, we're going to tell you about a new legal push in one state that could drastically change your all-important work-life balance. Lawmakers searing message to employers there, let your workers disconnect after hours, pay up. And let's get ready to rumble. Later in the hour, a conversation I'm especially excited about. We're getting into the ring with none other than WWE superstar Cody Rhodes on his road to the heavy-hitting WrestleMania 40 in Philadelphia, now just a few days away. It's going to be wrestling The Rock, Wayne Johnson. And so you know that is, right? I do. <laughs> and you're going to be there, right? I'm going to be there. We're excited. Making a trip so to cool. Philly just down the road. More on that in a bit. <laughs> We're going to begin this hour, of course, with the latest on the Israeli airstrike. It killed seven members of the humanitarian aid group World Central Kitchen. Israel says that it is launching an independent investigation into why its convoy was targeted in this attack. Jose Andres, the founder of the World Central Kitchen, condemned the airstrike, calling Israel's actions unforgivable. We are also learning new details about the victims and their involvement with the nonprofit. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv with more. Good morning to you. We are now learning the identities of all seven of those aid workers who died in that Israeli attack. They came from around the world, united in a mission to help the people of Gaza, and the president personally calling the founder of World Central Kitchen, Chef Jose Andres, to offer condolences. Overnight, President Biden paying tribute to the seven World Central Kitchen aid workers killed in a series of Israeli airstrikes. They were brave and selfless, he said of the victims, including 33-year-old Jacob Flickinger, a dual U.S.-Canadian citizen, seen here on a mission in Mexico. President Biden adding Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers. This incident is emblematic of a larger problem. This is like our meal rate to eat. The volunteers part of Chef Jose Andres's effort to get food to Gazans on the edge of famine. Writing in the New York Times, Andres describing them as the best of humanity. They are not faceless or nameless. They are not generic aid workers or collateral damage in war. 
He urged Israel to stop blocking food deliveries to Gaza. And highlighted Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's comment about the strike, this happens in war. Israel's top general overnight announcing findings of a preliminary investigation into the attack. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification at night during a war in a very complex condition. NBC News located each of the destroyed aid vehicles, finding they were attacked in at least three strikes over a mile and a half length of coastal road. World Central Kitchen says the cars were clearly marked with its logo and their movements coordinated with Israel's military ahead of time. We pressed an Israeli government spokesman. Israel tells the world that its strikes are based on precise intelligence, that it takes measures to make sure there are not civilians in the area. How can that possibly be true, given what happened here? There's a war going on. It, it, it's, a, it's a war zone. And in every war, sadly, um, tragically, uh, mistakes happen. And we do our very utmost to avoid those mistakes. World Central Kitchen pausing its Gaza aid operation for now, with three of its food ships turning back to sea. Several other aid groups doing the same. A major blow to the humanitarian effort when it's needed most. And we're learning that two days before that deadly airstrike, World Central Kitchen believes an Israeli sniper shot at one of its vehicles. The bullet damaged a wing mirror. No one was hurt, but the aid group did file a complaint to the Israeli military. We asked the IDF about that incident, but did not hear back. All right, Ralph Sanchez, thank you. Let's bring in Josh Phelps for more on this. He is the former director of relief operations for World Central Kitchen. Josh, uh, thank you for joining us. I know this is a tough time. You were friends with one of the victims, Zami Frankum, and, and you honored her last night, I understand, by spending time at her favorite bar in Washington. How are you doing right now? And just what are some of your thoughts about what happened in Gaza? Yeah, um, how am I doing? <laughs> Just, just still in shock, like most people. Um, you know, been overwhelmed by the the memories that people had of Zami and with Zami. Um, you know, and and learning more about the others. You know, a lot of people I'm close with and people who were out last night uh, knew Damien very well. Also, you know, even going to his engagement party in, uh, you know, over in Poland. Um, and then I had some people, a lot of people actually, who worked down in Acapulco with with Jacob, who I just saw you you all talk about. So um, it's just sort of, you know, piling on, um, just sort of the trauma of it all, especially for her uh, coworkers, um, who I've been in contact with a, a lot of them and former coworkers. But um, I think everyone's focus is just to get them home. Um, Maybe you all have some news on that, but just really looking forward to uh, the homecoming for them and then everyone to be able to go uh, back to to where those folks are from and, and you know, put them to, to rest at peace. For people who are hearing this story and just thinking, wow, it's really something that they were even in Gaza and specifically the northern part of Gaza, which has essentially been this kind of no-go zone uh, for quite some time now. That does not mean that people don't need help there, which is, of course, what they were mm -hmm. providing. But what do you make of where they were, the work that they were carrying out, where it was taking place? And tell us, if you can, in your experience with World Central Kitchen, the type of work that goes into making work on the ground like this possible, the type of coordination that's needed before sending employees into a war zone? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I left at the end, World Central at the end of 2021, right before they embarked um, on the Ukraine mission to, to help so many people there. Um, but the coordination, you know, they say they were coordinating with the IDF, and, and I believe that's true. Um, but historically, if you look at what's been going on in the war um, in the last six months, I don't think any type of coordination or protected vehicles or security patrol, you know, as, as you show these videos here, I mean, that these three cars, you know, that doesn't protect you against airstrikes, and airstrikes are daily. Um, I think it's a... I don't think it's a risk that should that it can be mitigated. I think the only way that you can mitigate it is by, um, you know, having less people there. Um, if you are coordinating on the ground with people who have been working in Gaza for 30, 40 years, which I know that some of these groups that World Central works with have, like ANERA, um, 
That's great. You know, you do the best you can. I, I think what a lot of us are wrestling with is, um, was there was there some sort of exponential uptick in aid by having several core team members on the ground who aren't mm. military, don't have military training, you know, um, and that's that's those are questions that I think will be answered in the coming days as as we learn more about about why they were there. Josh Phelps, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for sharing some memories with us. Mm. Uh, we know this is a tough time, and we're thinking of you and all your colleagues. Thank you. To Taiwan now, where several people are dead this morning, hundreds of others are injured after an earthquake struck the island during the morning rush hour. Yeah, the 7.4 magnitude quake is being called the island's most powerful tremor. In at least 25 years, it leveled dozens of buildings and left more than 87,000 households without power. Here's NBC News international correspondent Janice Mackey Frayer with the latest. The earthquake struck during the morning rush hour and was so strong, tremors were felt hundreds of miles away. At least seven people are dead. More than 700 have been injured. And rescue workers are only beginning to get a sense of the damage. At 7.4 magnitude, this is the strongest earthquake to hit Taiwan in a quarter century. It made city landmarks shake. A TV newsroom was swaying. Water was falling out of rooftop swimming pools. The worst hit city was Huailian on the eastern coast. Uh, that's about 15 miles from the epicenter of the earthquake. Emergency workers are trying to uh, search the rubble for people who may still be trapped under debris. Uh, the quake was felt here in mainland China and triggered tsunami warnings in the Philippines as well as Japan where thousands of people were ordered to evacuate to higher ground. Uh, crews in Taiwan are trying to reach people who are stuck on trapped roads. Uh, some are trapped in tunnels. Transport officials have said that major highways are impassable because of debris and fallen rock. Taiwan's fire department has said several buildings in Huailian have partially collapsed and a landslide along that coast has made its major highway unusable. It's why they're urging people to stay put and to not travel, especially in the mountains. This weekend marks a public holiday in Taiwan, as well as here in China, known as Qingming. Uh, it's when families typically travel to visit tombs and graves to honor relatives. But there have been dozens of aftershocks, and there's now rain in the forecast, meaning those damaged roads and those post-quake conditions will be that much more treacherous. All right, Janice, thank you so much. Closer to home, we're following that destructive storm system that has spawned several tornadoes and caused major flooding as it sweeps across the country. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is in LaGrange, Kentucky, where residents are cleaning up this morning after a twister touched down there yesterday. Maggie, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, we actually have a state of emergency declared here in Kentucky after three confirmed tornadoes swept across the state total. And as you point out, one of them touching down here, and you can see the power of that storm on display. A lot of that home's roof and kind of a huge chunk of the corner just ripped off and from what we can tell, tossed across the street into this neighbor's front yard. You see these massive boards, pieces of the roof here. We are seeing reports of widespread damage and power outages across roughly half a dozen states this morning. All of it the result of this latest round of that severe spring weather. Get in the house. See it? Yes, it's right there. Overnight, more dangerous and destructive weather. Tornadoes, high winds, and flooding rains punishing multiple states. Some of the worst damage in Kentucky, where at least three tornadoes touched down, the state's governor declaring a state of emergency. It sounded like a freight train rolling through our building. The storms tearing buildings apart. There's roofs collapsed, there's gas lines spraying gas everywhere. Houses were ripped off their foundations. Intense winds uprooting massive trees, crushing cars, and tearing down power lines, even sweeping people off their feet in Lexington. The wild weather this week affecting more than 100 million people in 30 states from Texas to Maine. This woman's car windows shattered by fierce winds as she drove to work in Indiana. Gravel in my head, there's glass in my head, you know, whatever, and mud, there's still mud behind my ears. While throughout the storm's path, nearly 250,000 without power. In Barnsdale, Oklahoma, neighbors helping neighbors, cleaning up from a tornado Monday that reduced homes to rubble. You know, we all got to help one another in this time of need.
Yeah, you love seeing the helpers. And speaking of helping one another, we've already got crews out here. You can kind of see some in the background, uh, those vans back there helping clean up the rubble in this neighborhood. It is worth noting we have seen reports of minor injuries thanks to these storms, but thankfully nothing worse than that. Just basically, Joe, once again, millions of Americans cleaning up after another round of severe weather sweeping across the country. I'll send it back to you. All right, Maggie Vespa. Maggie, thank you so much. Let's get more updates on the severe weather with a check of your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Angie Lastman's here. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Lots to talk about with that system that Maggie just mentioned continues to be an issue for folks across the East Coast here as we get through the day today and potentially even tomorrow in some spots. Right now, I want you to focus on the tornado watch that's in effect. It extends from Florida up through South Carolina, Savannah, Brunswick, Valdosta, Tallahassee, all those major cities involved in that tornado watch as we gear up for another kind of day where we have the potential, all the ingredients there, to see some of these uh, strong to even severe storms develop. It looks like 27 million people are mostly at risk for the chance of some strong wind gusts and the hail. The tornado risk is lower today, but it's still there, so we're gonna watch this. Again, Orlando up to Washington, D.C. is where we'll have that potential as the day goes on. We've also got a whole lot of rain to talk about across parts of the Mid-Atlantic moving into the Northeast. We've got the snow across parts of the Great Lakes, and we've got plenty of alerts because of that. The winter alerts topping 11 million. We've got flood watches in effect for 46 million people as we gear up for repeated rounds of some heavy rain. And we've also got these wind alerts that are up for 50 million people as we expect some really strong wind gusts through the day today, likely to disrupt travel, but also the power outages. You heard Maggie mention it. That's going to be a problem here through the day today as well with wind gusts anywhere from 30 to 40, even close to 50 miles per hour from great, the Great Lakes out towards parts of the Northeast. Uh, as far as the coast Coastal flooding is concerned. With those really strong onshore winds, it's not going to be hard for us to see some of that. Uh, so if you live close to the coast, keep that in mind. We'll also, on top of that, see some really heavy rain. These storm totals upwards of three, maybe three and a half inches. So not going to be difficult for us to see some of that flooding, including the streets, the highways, the rivers. We'll also see some of that significant snow uh, in portions of the new northern New England area, guys. And with those strong winds, blizzard conditions will likely be something we'll have to contend with through the day today. Mm. All right. Thank goodness there's not a Just blizzard a on eclipse day though right see yeah oh yeah. at least no there's that. no blizzard but we'll see if you, everybody's happy it's, I know. the eclipse clouds, is gonna be right? so I know. I know yeah i actually we're gonna hear a little bit from some people that have chased a lot of these and yeah. they said cloudy it's still beautiful i have seen the last one i did see in kansas city and it was cloudy i can confirm and you still experience it but it's of course not the well, not the Angie's same level downer. of thrill and he's a downer <laughs> It's just the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Fingers crossed. Maybe it'll be good. <laughs> well, there we go. Let's talk Eclipse. Make sure you've got your special glasses. Of course, now I can't find mine. Oh. <laughs> your dark cardboard glasses, Andy, because the total solar eclipse is set to cross a large swath of the United States. I'm going to ask you I can't read the prompter with these on. You really well, can't. People are lining up across the country to watch day quickly turn to night and then right <laughs> back again. Scientists say it does offer a rare chance. Do a lot of research in real time. Which is so cool. Dr. C. Alex Young is a solar astrophysicist with NASA, joins us now. Good morning, Dr. Young. Thanks for talking with us. I'm sure you're really used to the <laughs> glasses <morning>. jokes. <laughs> uh, but it's fun for us. It's novel for us that we've got some of these. Um, so this total solar eclipse is the only time we can actually see the outer atmosphere of the sun just looking at it with our own eyes. And so while we're all going to be amazed by that, I understand scientists are actually really looking for certain things, studying things during this eclipse. Tell us what that is. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can study. Now, in terms of studying the sun, that outer atmosphere of that corona mm -hmm. is where solar activity comes from, space weather, which can give us the beautiful aurora, but it also can impact our technology, GPS, communications, and even in the most extreme cases, knock out the power grids. But there are other kinds of science we can do. We can even study our own atmosphere by monitoring that um, shadow as it moves across, we see the change in the amount of light and the amount of energy. We can study the upper atmosphere, we can study the lower atmosphere, study weather, we can even study aspects of climate using this really unique opportunity. So from a personal standpoint, what are you most excited about during this mm. eclipse? Well, I'm really excited because this is first an opportunity to be with family and to share this experience because it's absolutely amazing. But as a scientist, 
the corona is such an amazing place to study, and the sun's activity is reaching the peak in its 11-year cycle. So this is a unique opportunity because the, the corona changes over the cycle. And so, for example, it looks much different than it did in 2017. And this is a chance to perhaps even see some of that activity during the eclipse itself, which would completely blow my mind. Yeah, okay, tell us more about what's going to be different, because I think it you was know, such an event. A lot of people actually got to experience that one, and we'll also get this one. Tell us other things that are different. I, I know, first and foremost, a lot more people might be able to see this one, but tell us what else. Yeah, more, ten, almost 10 million more people will see this. 31 million people live in the path. Be because the, the moon is closer, the shadow is slightly different, the path itself is wider. And also, um, we're going to have up to two minutes more of totality during the eclipse. So this is an opportunity for a lot more people to almost literally step out of their front door and experience this really phenomenal natural it's just one of the most amazing things that nature has to offer for us. I know we only have 30 seconds left with you, but NASA says solar eclipses can help scientists search for life on other planets. What? How is that? Well, understanding our atmosphere and understanding aspects of it, especially during solar activity, we take that information and we use it on these exoplanets that we have. And understanding the two and the relationship tells us things about whether or not life can actually form. Because understanding the sun, which is the key to it, helps us understand life everywhere in the universe. Very oh, yeah. cool. Dr. Look, you, C. like me, have to make these work over your glasses, which is <laughs> so cool, right? <laughs> Dr. C. Alex Young, thank you so much. We're so excited. You're excited. We can feel your energy. So thanks for joining thanks us. Thanks for having morning. me. Having a great eclipse day. Thank, thank you. you. You too. And so actually, after this eclipse on Monday, the U.S. is not going to experience another one for 20 years. But there will be other eclipses that can be seen in other places around the world. So eclipse chasers, those are people who travel across the country or even travel around the world to experience these rare solar phenomena. So as part of our NBC News Now special, Total Eclipse 2024 Countdown to History, I sat down with three self-proclaimed eclipse chasers. You all would call yourselves eclipse chasers. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it only takes once. What does it mean to be an eclipse chaser? What's the definition of that? I would say it's somebody who's been transformed by their experience in totality and then decides that they need that again and again and again. And my understanding, but tell me if this is right, you two were transformed just at the last one that we had here in the U.S. in 2017. Yep, that's right. What happened to you during totality? So we drove 14 hours uh, from our home in Rochester, New York, to a little town called Kimswick, Missouri, and it was just a complete moment of joy and calm for me. It was really different for me because <laughs> I thought, what is the big deal? It gets dark every night. I know what a shadow <laughs> is. I was more than happy to go on a mother-daughter road trip, but just, I hadn't expected it to be transformative. At totality, when the moon has fully eclipsed the sun and you see the beautiful corona of the sun around it, you see the stars start to come out. All around the horizon, there's a 360 degree sunset glow of red and orange. I was actually only aware of four bodies in the entire universe, the sun, the moon, the earth, and me. Eclipse chasing is a real community, right? Mm. What is that community like, and how strong is it? Once people get captured by this, they'll, they'll travel literally to the ends of the Earth to see the <laughs> next one. So for uh, a total eclipse in Australia uh, back in 23, they had almost 20,000 people descend upon this one tiny little peninsula out in the middle of nowhere. There are some record holders for seeing the most eclipses, and that is at 33. Anybody planning to break that record? Oh. You are the only one who yeah, can I was going to say. I started young enough. I might be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a goal, maybe? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I would love to. How many eclipses have you seen? I've seen 10 solar eclipses. Tell me about capturing an eclipse and the art that you make. I've currently done, I think, like 42 posters for this eclipse. Uh, extending all the way from San Antonio to Holton, Maine. So where will you all be on April 8th? 
I'm working with New York State Parks. We're gonna be up at Fairhaven Beach State Park on the shores of Lake Ontario, and we get three minutes and 26 seconds. We will be at Genesee Country Village in Mumford, New York, right outside Rochester. What do you want other young people who have maybe never seen an eclipse, maybe never experienced totality, to know or to think about, to encourage them to go check it out? It is such a small, beautiful event in your life. Um, it's getting in a car or getting on a train, getting to the spot and waiting. And it is such an emotional experience. It is such a personal experience that it can absolutely fit in your life. All right, our special Total Eclipse 2024 Countdown to History is streaming on Peacock and NBC News Now right now. So go check it out. And starting Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, you can join Lester Holt and the NBC News team across the country for live special coverage of the rare total solar eclipse. You can watch live on NBC, streaming on NBC News Now. You can also find live updates throughout the day on NBCNews.com. To politics, President Biden's and former President Trump's primary wins continued overnight, having already clinched their respective parties' nominations. Both men are dialing up their general election campaign efforts, with Trump back on the trail yesterday, making controversial comments at events in Michigan and Wisconsin. NBC's Garrett Haig joins us with the latest. Garrett, good morning. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, the primary results last night were not exactly surprising, but they were welcome, especially for Mr. Trump, who spent most of the last three weeks more focused on courtrooms than on campaigning. With this new Wall Street Journal poll showing him narrowly leading President Biden in six out of seven battleground states, he came back to the trail yesterday with a bit of wind at his back. You win Michigan, you win the election. Donald Trump returning to the campaign trail Tuesday for a two-state battleground barnstorm, rallying supporters in Michigan and Wisconsin. The former president also ramping up his attacks on President Biden's border policies. I'm here tonight to declare that Joe Biden's border bloodbath ends the day I take the oath of office. Mr. Trump highlighting the March murder of 25-year-old Michigander Ruby Garcia, who police allege was killed by her boyfriend, an undocumented immigrant deported in 2020, who later re-entered the country. Now Ruby's loved ones and community are left grieving for this incredible young woman. Mr. Trump lambasting a lack of federal action on the border, despite rallying Republicans in Congress to tank a bipartisan border security bill negotiated in the Senate earlier this year. There is zero chance I will support this horrible open borders betrayal of America. It's not going to happen, and I'll fight it all the way. The former president arguing that despite falling national crime rates, he is the best candidate on crime and safety. The suburban housewives actually like Donald Trump. You know why? Because I'm the one that it's going to keep them safe. On Tuesday, President Biden's campaign focused on defending abortion rights, releasing this new ad. Donald Trump doesn't trust women. I do. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. The political ad will air in battleground states and Florida, where voters supported Mr. Trump in the last two elections, but where the state Supreme Court just ruled a six-week abortion ban will go into effect next month. President Biden's campaign manager predicting that abortion issues being front and center in Florida will fire up Democrats, calling the Sunshine State winnable. It comes as a new poll from the Wall Street Journal shows Mr. Trump with narrow leads in other swing states, leading President Biden in six of the seven most competitive states. Now, Mr. Trump yesterday also told NBC News he'd have more to say on the abortion issue in a week's time. President Biden's campaign quickly trolling him on social media with a reminder of Mr. Trump's previous boasts about ending Roe v. Wade, suggesting he's already had plenty to say on this issue for voters to consider. Joe. All right, Garrett, thank you so much. Much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including a concerning new missile test from North Korea that's drawing international condemnation this morning over the fuel the country is using to power it. First, though, after the break, the dramatic and dangerous cliffside rescue in California. You'll have to see to believe that's next. We are back now with a look at the daring rescue of a man who was hanging on the side of a cliff near the Golden Gate Bridge after falling during a hike. The Sonoma County Sheriff's Department share how they pulled off one of the most dangerous missions of their careers. Clinging to this cliffside near California's Golden Gate Bridge, a terrified man in desperate need of rescue. 
The Sonoma County Sheriff's Office says he fell from a recreational area. You can see him here holding on to the gravel rock face, his feet bare. Rescue crew Henry One using thermal imaging to locate the man 50 to 60 feet below the hiking trail after a distress call came into the Southern Marin Fire Department. Hey, don't let go, man. After setting up for a long line rescue, the chopper hovers close by. Tactical flight officer Lawrence Matelli then deploys to retrieve the man who had been hanging on for almost an hour. Right here, through. Here you go. Carefully placing him into a rescue harness. Grab your crotch and we lift up, okay? Grab your crotch. My fear as we were flying in there was that I was going to watch this guy fall to his death. The chopper then ascends with the officer and victim attached by a cable. I got you, brother. Landing at the top of the cliff, where officials from the fire and rescue department gave the victim a medical evaluation. As far as uh, my, my personal experience, this is definitely one of the um, probably more, more dangerous rescues. The deputies, with years of experience and rescue operations under their belt, say this one was uniquely challenging because of poor vision in the night. I barely had any footing. The pilot and I, we have great communication. So the whole time we're, we're talking to each other, giving him height call outs and then where we need to basically where he needs to put me in order to try and save this guy. I have to be very, very precise with where I put Larry. And then that's complicated at nighttime uh, because of the lack of depth perception, uh, lack of peripheral vision. A team working in tandem prepared for any scenario. Well, we're very lucky. We get a lot of training, um, and this is exactly um, what we train for. It's very important to be, to be ready because when you get a call like this, there's no warming up, there's no practicing. You arrive on scene, and, and it's go time. By the way, that hike in San Francisco becomes popular around this time of year, but after this particular rescue effort, officials warned other hikers to be extra careful if and when they head out on the trail. Seems like some good advice there. All right, time now for international headlines. North Korea has tested a new hypersonic missile. Claudia Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudia, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. That's right. KCNA, the North Korean state news agency, confirmed that on Tuesday, Pyongyang test fired this new type of hypersonic missile. Now, this is the latest test by North Korea of this new kind of uh, missile, which is powered by solid fuel, which can be faster to deploy than liquid fuel variants. KCNA said Kim Jong un oversaw the launch and called it a strategic weapon showcasing the absolute superiority of North Korea's defense technology and will give the country the capacity for, and I quote, of course, rapidly, accurately, and powerfully striking any enemy target worldwide. The latest uh, launch drew condemnation from South Korea, Japan, and of course, the United States. And let's go to Haiti now, where according to a United Nations report, more than 53,000 people have fled the capital, Port-au-Prince, in less than three weeks. According to the reports released on Tuesday, panic civilians are fleeing the capital as armed gangs have been fighting over territory since Prime Minister Ariel Henry resigned three weeks ago, leaving the city and country in a power vacuum. The UN says that more than 60% are headed to Haiti's rural southern region, which is worrying because humanitarian organizations do not have sufficient infrastructure there and host communities do not have sufficient resources to cope with a large influx of people. And let's end this tour of the world in Botswana, where the president has threatened to send 20,000 elephants to Germany in a political dispute. Germany is the European Union's largest importer of African elephant trophies, and earlier this year, the country's environment minister suggested there should be stricter limits on importing hunting trophies. Well, the proposal enraged the president of Botswana, which is home to about a third of the world's elephant population, who said elephant numbers have exploded as a result of conservation efforts, and hunting helped them kept in check. Now, as a result, he offered to send 20,000 elephants to Germany, saying it was not a joke and it will take no for an answer. Now, talking about addressing the elephant in the room there. <laughs> Back to you, uh -huh. Chris. All right, Claudio, Good thank one. you so much. Coming up, uh -huh. should... <laughs> Coming up, should you have the right to completely disconnect after work? It's a question that's being asked a lot more often lately. Now, one state's actually looking to find companies that cut into your off time. We're going to dig into that next. We're back with new efforts to try and strike the correct work-life balance. Always tough. While well, employees are pushing to draw a line between the end of a workday and the start of their personal lives. For some, that means not responding to 
calls or emails or texts after hours from their boss. NBC News correspondent Emily Akeda joins us to tell us more about this. Emily, good morning. Hey, good morning. We know work-life balance has increasingly become a priority for many in the U.S. In fact, one survey shows the majority of workers would be willing to take a 20% pay cut for improved quality of life. But how they go about achieving that is up for debate. As the digital age blurs workplace boundaries, there's a push to give employees the right to ignore emails, texts, and calls after hours. Calling me on my day off is beyond me. While similar laws have already been enacted in some other countries, California could become the first U.S. state to require employers to give their workers the right to disconnect during non-working hours, unless explicitly noted or in the case of an emergency. Violations could be punishable by a fine. It would be nice to not even have the stress of thinking that someone might call you. It would be uh, probably good for your mental health. California Assembly member Matt Haney penned the proposal. Why introduce this bill? You shouldn't, just because you have a smartphone, be expected to work 24-7 uh, without consenting to that. Let's make sure that there's some time for people to be able to disconnect. It comes amid a broader wave of efforts to prioritize work-life balance and hang up on so-called extreme expectations. Hashtags like Act Your Wage, Bare Minimum Mondays, and Quiet Quitting have racked up millions of views on social media. I will not sacrifice my mental health and wellness for somebody else's profits. Last month, Senator Bernie Sanders introduced a bill to cut the standard work week from five to four days. Despite massive growth in technology and worker productivity, millions of workers in our country are working longer hours for lower wages. The overlap of work and personal life has been turbocharged by the pandemic. Pew Research reports the majority of workers respond to messages outside of their normal hours, at least sometimes. 28% do so often. I understood what I was signing on for. John Ferrari makes himself available around the clock for a tech startup in Silicon Valley, but says he gets flexibility in return. I'm contacted on a regular basis, often multiple times a day. Um, and we operate our company like a family, so I'm available whenever my family needs me. And there is concern around productivity from businesses both small and large. And once you implement something like a four-day work week, it's hard to go back. But advocates for such changes say businesses will see increased productivity and retention rates pointing to experiments worldwide. For instance, 92% of employers who took part in a four-day work week trial in the UK are keeping the practice in place. Could you imagine switching to a four-day work week and then being like, never mind, we're going <laughs> yeah. back to five. Welcome uh -huh. back to the five day. Yeah, yeah that's quite so the... True. It's an Quite interesting conversation for yeah. sure. Emily, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Let's talk more about this with Johnny C. Taylor Jr. He's the CEO of Society for Human Resource Management. Good to have you with us, Johnny. So what do you make of this push to try and give the workers the right legally to disconnect at the end of a working day? Is this an important step in trying to improve that work-life balance? I think it's an important discussion to have right now. And frankly, companies are responding to it. We understand that employees want what we more appropriately use the term is work-life integration. One of the guys I just heard on the interview said, like, I also get a lot of flexibility at work. The idea that you're going to have balance at work on any particular week or day is probably, uh, you know, from the past. But in recent times, companies have said, like, integrated. I get it. I may have to call you on Saturday, but many of us are working remotely on Mondays or Wednesdays or Mondays and Fridays. So just integrate it a little bit. The idea that you could just say nine and five between nine and five on any particular day, you can call me. After that, I'm off, I'm literally untouched, untouchable. That's not going to work well for hmm. employers. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give? Like, let's set the, the legal aspect or th this becoming law to the side. And just for an employee who wants to be able to at least have a conversation with their boss about this to kind of have more, uh, you know, autonomy, not be so in touch post the workday. How can they get that conversation started? Well, that's precisely what we encourage. Just sit down and talk 
talk with your people manager, your human resources manager, or your front, your your supervisor, and say, look, listen, I want to be available. I want to help this company. I know productivity is important because ultimately, if I'm more productive and you're more profitable, then I can make more money and have more jobs security. Just have the discussion. We have found overwhelmingly that employers understand that. That being said, there's some really high demand environments where you know what you're signing up for. We often, you know, we talk about going to Wall Street and working in the major firms. If you're making significant amounts of money, then there is going to be a trade-off. You can't have it all. Johnny, what are the negative effects on productivity if people do more ignoring of these work after hours, work calls, emails, text messages? Well, clearly people burn out and that and employers are fully aware of that. And it's not in our best interest to burn our employees out. Just think about an athlete. A coach knows that you've got to sit that athlete down every once in a while. You're going to destroy their knees or their back. You know, we get it that you can't work people 24 seven, but you also can't get into this idea of balance. And, and we don't even, we're not even real sure what that means. Employers are expected, are expected to get a return on their investment. And the investment is what we pay our employees. All right, Johnny C. Taylor Jr. from the Society of Can Human Resources. Yeah, go ahead. Just one other quick, I got to tell you, one of the most important facts is remember, and I tell employees, be careful here, because if you won't, given all of the talk around AI, if you won't do it, mm. maybe that computer will answer when you won't pick up. That and so is... the technology, the AI that we have could take Ooh. your job. Okay, that's something else to keep in mind. It is. You know, I think it's a good a important measure to think yeah. about it in a measured way. Yeah. All right. Johnny absolutely. C. Taylor, thank you. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. All right, Be coming well. up, let's get ready to rumble. Yeah, after the break, we're stepping into the ring with the one and only Cody Rhodes, WWE superstar, as he prepares for a monstrous WrestleMania 40 going down this weekend in Philly. Uh-oh, uh-oh, he's coming for us. We're going to bring you that conversation. <laughs> Next, this is Morning News Now. Exciting interview with our friend Joe Fryer. Yeah, is Savannah, so we are just three days away from WrestleMania 40, which is often called the Super Bowl of pro wrestling. It's a two-night event, there you hear the bell, taking place Saturday and Sunday at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. That is where the Eagles play. So on each night, there's a main event. Our next guest is going to be in the ring for both of those matches, Saturday and Sunday. WWE superstar Cody Rhodes joins us now. Cody, good to have you live in yeah, studio. Thank you very How much. excited are you for WrestleMania this well, year? Uh, beyond excited for WrestleMania, but I feel like the financial minute it didn't happen. So <laughs> do I you was, want to do? <laughs> I I don't know what's up or down. You know, what tips do you have for here's people the best on, their, thing on their spending <laughs> financially that has ever been told to me? Was spend it now, you'll make more later. Ooh, good. So good for everyone or not out there, good advice. From Cody minutes, spend it now, you'll make more later. You know, will it into existence? All right. I think our folks at CNBC right now are, are a little worried. All right. <laughs> Maybe let's talk about your area of expertise, yes, yes, which yes, is yes. WWE. So I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but you've got a tag team match on the first night on Saturday mm. night. It's you, Seth Rollins, against Roman Reigns and The Rock. Mm. And what kind of happened here was initially there was a plan. The Rock was going to face Roman Reigns in the main event. And the yeah. fans spoke up and they said, no, they wanted you to be in this main event match. They literally said, we want Cody. How did that feel to have the fans sort of surge and say they wanted to put you in that big match? Well, I, I think you, as a wrestler, we always assume like the world orbits around us, you know, oh my gosh, they they really do like me and oh, I'm doing so great. And there's a term in sports entertainment, I'm, I'm so over whatever it might be, but you really don't know until a situation like that comes up and nothing in my entire career will ever be as touching. I know, you know, we were in the world of beating each other up and slamming each other around, but just the fact that the biggest movie star on the planet came in and they still do love him. The final boss, The Rock, doesn't realize that they still do love him. They just didn't want him to step in front of this year-long story that we've been a part of and, and me trying to capture a championship my family's never held before. So this is entirely, this WrestleMania both nights is dedicated to the fans in the biggest way possible, because without them genuinely having spoken up, I wouldn't be in the slot. I, who knows if I'd even be on WrestleMania. So you will now be wrestling in a tag team match yeah. against The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, one of the biggest stars on the planet. For those who aren't mm -hmm. following, he's a bad guy now, which is which is a pretty dramatic turn. How but is, is he? Is it right? So the fans do he? seem to like him, right? Well, The Rock is really cool, <laughs> right? And even though 
even though I've now been on the receiving end of him throwing my head into my own tour bus, he's whipped me with my weight belt. We've had some uh, significant physicality. Just, I, just some small minor issues. Just a couple, you know, <laughs> a couple flesh wounds here. But uh, I don't think he realizes that people still love him. He is under the final boss, which is now how he's deemed himself, is the people's champ. And if anything, maybe WrestleMania will remind him of that. And if not... He hasn't been in the ring in, I believe, 12 years. I'm going to run circles around him anyways. Yeah, what's it going to be like so. to be in the ring with The Rock? I think uh, we'll match up probably very nicely if we got a little taste of it this past Monday. Uh, I think we'll match up really nicely. I'm, I'm concerned about The Rock because it's the unknown. He hasn't been in the ring for 12 years, but he's clearly in incredible shape and can still go, yeah. no doubt. Yeah, packs, he looks pretty good. <laughs> packs a wallop of a punch, too. But Roman Reigns is the the undisputed champion for 85 years at this point. It's just a never-ending situation with him being the champion and being the leader of WWE. So he's the one that you really have to look out for. He's the one who beat me at WrestleMania last year. He's the true leader of the overall bloodline. So that's the one that I I worry about, if I worry about either of them. You mentioned your family. Your nickname mm -hmm. is the American Nightmare. Your father was the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, a legend in the industry. How much have you been thinking about him leading up to this? Uh, it's funny because he has such a f fingerprint on WrestleMania 40, which as I was younger, I always thought like, oh, people will, you know, he'll fade, right? Like, and I always thought of that in a sad way, like, oh, people will forget. And now I'm looking at WrestleMania 40 and here's The Rock, who he was partners with Rock's dad, Rocky Johnson, so they were tag team partners. Here's Mr. Heyman on the outside. He gave him his first job and the sports entertainment and pro wrestling world. Here's Roman and Seth Rollins, two of Dusty's kids from NXT, who he helped groom and get ready for the main roster. And then his actual son, myself, being in the mix is really, uh, you know that classic, oh, he saw it, he'll be there? It really is. It does yeah, feel like very, that. Very much is touching that main event. All right. Cody Rhodes, thank you so much. Thank we you. appreciate your time this morning. Of course, you'll be able to watch WrestleMania this Saturday and Sunday, streaming on Peacock. Buddy, appreciate your time. Good Thanks, luck, man. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Awesome interview. Let's try it again with some financial headlines. Paramount and production company Skydance are closer to striking an acquisition deal. We're going to have CNBC Savannah Hanau join us <laughs> to comment on this this morning. I'm so, here. Hannah, good I'm morning. here, Savannah. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'm here. I can hear you. Let's get you those headlines. All right. Paramount Global may be moving closer to a sale. The New York Times reports Paramount is considering exclusive talks with Skydance, the media and entertainment company led by David Ellison. Now, Paramount's board is seeking to sell all instead of parts of the company, which includes Paramount Studios, CBS, Nickelodeon, and Comedy Central. The stock is down about 20% this year. Meanwhile, Amazon is removing the Just Walkout technology from its Amazon Fresh grocery stores. The system charged shoppers automatically as they walk out without the need for a cashier. Now, the stores will instead use dash cards and these allow shoppers to use their carts to scan items while shopping and also doesn't require them to interact with a cashier. Just Walk Out was a major innovation when it debuted years ago. There are currently 44 Amazon Fresh stores in the U.S. with more than half using the technology. And Yahoo is pushing further into artificial intelligence. The platform is buying Artifact. That's an AI news app created by the co-founders of Instagram. They launched the product last year, but it was shuttered just three months ago as it just never caught on with users. Yahoo is buying the app for the technology, which personalizes and recommends news articles. Yahoo News attracts more than 185 million people, people per month. All right, Silvana Hanau, thank you so much. You got it. We've got more morning news now right after the break. Stay with us. We are going to end this hour with a look at the program behind the Oscar-winning documentary, The Last Repair Shop. The film took a look at the shop where students in the L.A. Unified School District go to have their instruments fixed for free. Well, now those technicians are receiving some much-needed support in expanding this one-of-a-kind program. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has the story. They call it The Last Repair Shop. The place where thousands of instruments for the Los Angeles Unified School District come for a tune-up. That pad is a little worn out. And repairs. What makes this place so special? First of all, because it does magic for kids. 
It's also the only one of its kind left in the country. Supervisor Steve Bogmanian says for a district where 87% of students live at or below poverty, it gives them a chance to play music. This is a jewel for a parent not to think what I'm going to get this $200 or $300 to repair my child's saxophone. It's huge. It's huge. And yet its future is in jeopardy. Before cutbacks, there were 30 technicians that worked here. Now there's only 10. But the hope is that one speech might help change that. And the Oscar goes to... When a documentary about the shop recently won an Academy Award, director Chris Bowers used that giant audience to shine a light on those unseen technicians. Tonight, you are sung, you are thanked, and you are seen. Those words resonating with so many. Donations have since come pouring in. In just a week, we raised over $100,000. An investment in the future. It just filled me with such joy to know that there's people out there who want to support kids in the arts. And truly music to Steve's ears. See how open the sound is? The plan now is to staff up and start an apprenticeship program. It's special when you see that smile on the child's face. That's the Oscar for us. A shop that not only fixes instruments, but changes lives. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. What a neat story. That is going to do it for us on this hour of Morning News Now this Wednesday morning. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.